Hi, my name is George Stolfi. I am professor at the Computer Science Department of, of the University of Campinas and a co-principal investigator of the Neuromat project. Um, so this talk here is going to try to present the brain, what the little I know of the brain, about, uh, in a way that will be um, um, uh, tempting to a theoretical computer scientists. Um, I apologize that there will not be any theorems or algorithms, but uh, uh, I hope that you will find it interesting. I must also explain that I am uh, uh, not a neuroscientist. I am a, an electronics engineer who turned computer scientist and mathematician by, uh, by accident. and. Uh, uh, all I know of, of about the brain, I learned in the few years that I've been with the Neuromat project. Um, okay, so um, I, I will talk a little bit about the structure of the ne nervous system of animals, um, both the behavior of the elementary components of that uh, uh, of the nervous system, which is the neuron. I will talk about how we can model uh, networks of neurons mathematically um, and describing some uh, one specific model, one class of models, and uh, then um, try to characterize the behavior of the neuron in terms of a computing element, what, what sort of computing function it performs. And then I will talk a little bit about the structure of the human, cor human cortex of the brain uh, as an example of uh, a structure that uh, is uh, the object of uh, neuroscience studies. Okay, so then um, the nervous system is, uh, is um, a characteristic of all animals that distinguish them from plants. One of the things that distinguish them from plants, it evolved more than 500 million years ago, and all animals have um, a nervous system, except sponges, maybe. And uh, all of them have, all those nervous systems are made basically of the same um, kind of cells, the called neurons which work more or less the same thing in all animals. Uh, that's uh, apparently some one thing that has been uh, well conserved. Of course, there are many specialized neurons that have evolved in different species, but the basic uh, f uh, physiology, physiology and the functioning of the neuron is the same in all animals. So a neuron is the, the, the general scheme of a neuron, the general anatomy, is like that. There is a cell body, and it has many uh, thin, long uh, extensions. Uh, many of them are called uh, dendrites uh, that are input, essentially input wires. And there is one output wire uh, uh, called the axon uh, that uh, eventually branches off and connects to other neurons. So um, the, <coughs> the neuron collects signals from other neurons to the dendrites, send it through the compute some function, and sends the output to other neurons to the axon. Um, there are specialized neurons that are called sensory neurons that instead of receiving inputs from other neurons, they receive inputs from um, other physical quantities like temperature, pressure, uh, position, uh, gravity, or whatever. And there are also effector neurons that instead of sending signals to other neurons, they send signals to muscles, to other organs that uh, change their behavior based on the output of the neuron. Uh, here is a picture of the human brain, which is where most of our neurons are. Uh, there are a few other neurons scattered throughout our body, but most, the vast majority of them are collected in this organ. It's a very complicated organ. Uh, you can see that it has several anatomically different uh, parts. Um, the most, not a, most conspicuous ones, well, this is the spinal cord, the beginning of the spinal cord that goes down to the rest, carries, uh, is basically a big bundle of axons that goes down uh, and then spread us out to the rest of our body. 
Uh, this part here is the cerebellum, which is a specialized part of the brain that uh, um, controls muscles directly. So when, for example, you want to grab a, a cup of coffee on a table, um, the, eventually that instruction goes to the cerebellum that figures out exactly which muscles of a dozen muscles that you have to move, how much force you have to apply to each muscle, how much uh, for long and with what sequence to actually get your hand over there. So 90% of the neurons of the brain are actually in the cerebellum, but they are very small and they are very similar to each other. We don't understand completely how they work either, but, um, and, but it is a very specialized organ that seems concerned only with that controlling muscles. Uh, and this big thing here is the uh, co um, cortex, basically, the, the, outside, the, the uh, outside view of the cortex. The cortex has two hemispheres, as you probably know, and they are separated by a, a big uh, uh, cleft in the middle, connected only by this white part over here. Uh, so what we are seeing here is the wall of one of the halves of the thing. Um, it, um, it is actually very, I mean, the, the whole brain is actually very soft. I never touched one, but uh, they say that it is uh, soft like custard or something like that. I mean, it's, it doesn't have any connective tissue or anything that gives it strength. It is, um, um, this is um, a cut, an horizontal cut of the brain that shows uh, through the cortex in particular. The cortex itself is actually only this part that's shown in brown here. In real, this is a prepared specimen, but in real life, those are, uh, that's pink. And this is where all the neurons are uh, of the cortex. Uh, and uh, this lighter part here in the middle, which is white in the, real brain is the white matter. It is just wires, just connect axons that go through several, across from several, from the, some part of the cortex to another part of the cortex. Um, um, so here are some numbers just for the cortex. That uh, the cort I mean, the cortex is particularly interesting, not only because, well, it is the biggest part, but because it is also where most of the higher functions of the brain seems to be, like interpreting images from the visual, interpreting sounds, uh, reasoning, and um, um, abstract reasoning, like algebra or whatever, mathematics, is all dealt in the cortex, and also, when you want, when you decide that you need more coffee, uh, you have to decide to grab, uh, that you must grab the, the cup that is over there. So that reasoning that you must move your arm over there is made on the cortex. Then that command goes to the cerebellum that actually controls the muscles. So uh, the cortex is that, li that little layer here, the, 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 this outer skin of the of the that part of the brain. If you were to spread it out, it would be about one square meter in area. Uh, so you can think of it of a big balloon that is about I mean this 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 size. Uh, it is only three millimeters, actually a bit less, two and a half millimeters thick. Uh, that, and the, it contains fifteen billion neurons. I mean, so maybe. 150 billion neurons are in the cerebellum. Um, uh, and um, each neuron um, has about, receives inputs from about 10,000 uh, other neurons and sends output to 10,000 other neurons in, on the average. So that's already a big difference between uh, the circuits that we build in our computers uh, and uh, the brain because uh, the components in our uh, in the circuits that we design, usually have only a, a few inputs and a few outputs. Uh, so, um, so the complexity of the brain is not only because there are 15 billion neurons, but because there are in total 150 trillion connections between them. 
which is uh, a lot more than there are in a in, even in the largest CPUs. Um, and those things are packed extremely compactly. I mean, there are in each cubic millimeter of the brain of the cortex there are thirty thousand neurons, about that, um, and one uh, billion synapses, um, and four kilometers in one cubic millimeter there are four kilometers of wiring of uh, ax specifically axons, current rate. And uh, so imagine imagine your the data centers that have big spaghetti piles of computers. Imagine that you throw away the boxes of the, of the uh, routers and you put everything, the chips and the, the wires in a hydraulic press and you press it down very compactly. <laughs> so that, that gives you an idea of what the cortex looks like in the microscope. That makes it almost impossible to, to study uh, by ordinary means, by microscopes, because we, all, if we look at that, all we see is that this big mess of wires, and we can only see little parts of the wires and pieces of neurons, and we can't tell where they are connected, actually. Um, so if you look instead per area, for each square millimeter of the cortex, looking across the, that layer, there are about 1,000 neurons. Um, and so uh, the axons are very thin. It is uh, only a third of a millionth of a, of a, uh, of a meter uh, across. Um, and each, each axon is actually, on the average, is about five, five centimeters long. I mean, many of them are very short, but some of them are very long. There is a neuron at the back uh, that's not in the brain, but in the bottom of the spine that has an axon that goes down to the tip of your toe. That's uh, the sensory organ that you use to detect furniture in the dark, right? <laughs> um, so how, how does, a, what, how, how does a, a neuron work? Basically, the important thing that actually, um, well, it's a cell, of course, it has lots of metabolism that just to stay alive. But the important thing about it is that uh, the mem um, it is a, uh, the, each neuron is essentially a, a bag of liquid with a very thin um, membrane. It's only two molecules across. Uh, the, 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 the liquid is ba basically a water solution of several things, and uh, the membrane is made of uh, fat, uh, a, f kind, a special kind of fat. Um, so the membrane is actually half liquid, it's not very solid either, but uh, it holds the thing together <laughs> with that shape. And um, uh, so and that, that membrane, since it is a fat, it is an insulator, and um, there are different amounts of electric charge inside and outside the membrane. So the membrane works like a capacitor in electrical engineering. Uh, and across the membrane there are certain molecules that uh, made of protein, the protein molecules that uh, uh, can either let uh, uh, ions, sodium, chlorine, potassium, calcium, go through, or can acti actively pump them. I mean, even uh, I mean, you can take a, a positive charged uh, ion from a place that is negatively, that has negative, uh, potential and push it up into the side that has positive potential. Okay, so in general, the inside, the interior of the of the cell, which is would be this side here, has a negative charge uh, and uh, comp relative to the outside. Okay, so the, uh, if you measure with a voltmeter, if you stick two electrodes on each side of the membrane, you will measure something between 80 or to 40 millivolts uh, with the negative side inside, okay? Um, and so, but the, the, that, that uh, potential difference is not constant, it changes as the neuron processes information. Basically, um, every time, uh, so uh, b basically every time the neuron receives a, um, a signal from another neuron, 
its potential increases a little bit. Uh, and so the, this would be the, the, the graph of a neuron that has only a few inputs. So each step here is uh, one signal that it receives, one bit of information that it received from another neuron. And if the potential reaches a certain point, like here, this, you went uh, a certain um, triggering potential uh, that could be, for example, 40 millivolts negative, then something happens. Some, some of those uh, ion pumps that are in the membrane, they are usually turned off. They sense the difference of uh, as a rigid on minus 40 millivolts, and then they start working and they pump charge into the, the neuron. That raises the potential rapidly to something positive, including, inclusive, uh, up to a certain peak potential. And then the, the, those pumps shut off, and then reverse pumps start working and they pull the potential back down again. They pump charge out of the, uh, of the neuron. And so in the end, I mean, the potential was uh, something like 40 millivolts negative at the start of that spike. And when it ends, it may be, say, 60 millivolts negative. Uh, okay, and then the thing begins again. The, um, the potential gets increased every time uh, a signal comes in. And if it reaches the triggering potential, it spikes, not a spike, of course. And while there are no inputs, the the potential slowly decays because uh, there there are some ion channels that let uh, charge that, uh, that keep some ion pumps that keep pumping charge no matter what, and so they try to keep the to push the charge towards a negative, let's say minus 80 millivolts. Okay, so in the absence of signals, the thing decays to minus 80. Every time there is an input signal, it jumps up a little bit. And if it reaches uh, minus 40, then there is this peak. And then it comes back to minus 60. And then the thing repeats again. Okay. So each of those spikes lasts about one millisecond. And they cannot repeat. I mean, one, one can happen only after the previous one has finished. So the maximum rate at which those spikes can happen is uh, one kilohertz, about or about that. Okay. So when when one of those spikes happen, um, the voltage doesn't change uh, at the same time throughout the whole neuron. Instead, the body does that spike, and then that spike propagates down the axon at a certain speed. Uh, and it propagates in the like that. I mean, there is a along the axon. The axon is initially at that triggering potential. Let's say minus 40 millivolts. Uh, then the, the, there is a small region that's actually spiking, that is pumping uh, charge in. So it raises the potential to the uh, plus 20, something like that. And immediately after that, that, those pumps stop. And then right behind them, there is a, a region that, uh, that's pump where the other IO pumps are pumping charge out. And those uh, only stop when the potential here is negative minus 60. So, so you get this little uh, disturbance that uh, walks down the axon turning the potential from the trigger potential minus 40 here to the reset potential minus 60 here. Uh, that's, that's basically a signal traveling down the axon. And that signal about travels with the speed, it depends um, on the kind of axon and how well insulated it is and whatever. So it changes between half a meter per second to 100 meters per second. Uh, basically, the fastest seems to be the, the things that sense touch. If you touch something, the sensors here send a signal immediately to the brain at 100 meters per second. So, and uh, sensors for pain actually are very slow. I mean, so if you cut your finger, <laughs> it may take uh, two seconds for you to actually feel the pain or something like that. So. Um, the, the magnitude of the spike is not, you can I mean, figure out from this picture that uh, the, the magnitude of the spike is not important because as, as the thing travels down the, the axon, 
if the axon is a bit thicker or, or thinner or whatever, this the amount of voltage that it spikes will change. But uh, the, the thing travels down as a unit. Um, so the important thing here is only that there is this wave going through or not, not uh, the actual value of it or how wide it is or whatever. And whenever the axon branches, the, this disturbance branches too. And each branch gets a wave that is just as strong as the, the first one. So all the 10,000 outputs, uh, neurons that receive output from the neuron, they get exactly the same strength, more or less, as the, uh, okay. So when, when uh, the disturbance reaches the end of an axon, it has to go through the dendrite of the next neuron. And the connection between the two is called a synapse. And uh, the signal is transmitted across that synapse by chemical means, not by electrical means. Uh, basically, when the, uh, the, impo the impulse, each synapse is unidirectional. It goes from the axon to the dendrite and sends signals that way and doesn't usually send signals the other way. Although there are, maybe there might be cases where that happens too, but uh, mostly it is unidirectional. The signals only travel that direction. Uh, and what happens is when the, that region, uh, that the disturbance along the neuron reaches the synapse, um, it, the synapse contains lots of little vesicles with a substance called a neurotransmitter. And uh, when the signal reaches the synapse, those vesicles, they fuse with the membrane and dump the neurotransmitter in the space between the two, uh, the two neurons. And then on the other neuron, there are uh, protein molecules that are activated by that neurotransmitter and start, they activate pumps that start pumping charge into the other neuron. So there is, the electrical signal arrives here, it uh, gets turned into a chemical signal and the chemical signal gets turned into an electrical signal. And, and these pumps, they, well, they start pumping for a while, then they stop and the neurotransmitter is absorbed back into the, the vesicle or destroy it in some other way. Uh, so the effect of one pulse arriving at synapse is that the other neuron gets uh, an increase, a certain amount of potential increase in its potential. Uh, so it will, so that those are in this little diagram here. Each of those steps here corresponds to uh, one signal going through a synapse and getting turned into a, an amount of charge that gets pumped into the thing, okay. Um, so, well, um, um, how do we model that thing mathematically? I mean, that, that's our goal, trying to understand the brain is trying to build a mathematical or a physical description of it. I mean, we, we um, because uh, it's very clear that the physics itself is not very important. There is, a, I mean, you can, uh, it, for many things, we can abstract from the physics to a mathematical model that uh, doesn't take into account whether it is chlorine or sodium or uh, which molecule is particularly is being involved in the thing. The only thing that matters is whether there is a, the neuron spikes or what the voltage uh, moves and so forth. So. So the, the goal is to devo develop models um, for, um, for the brain and for neurons and for new nervous systems that are still realistic enough that we can uh, uh, use them to understand how the brain works, uh, but they are simple enough for mathematical analysis and efficient enough so that we can do large scale computations with hundreds of thousands or millions of neurons uh, in a finite time. Um, and there, uh, there is one thing that plays in our favor, which is our ignorance of the, how the brain works. I mean, because um, we only know partially how the neurons work. I mean, because each neuron is different. Uh, there are many types of neurons. And we have uh, physical models, electrical models, 
only for a few of them and they need lots of lots of parameters that we don't know exactly how what the value of those parameters are in a particular neuron. Um, the topology of the network is mostly unknown. As I explained it before, I mean, each cubic millimeter of the brain has uh, four kilometers of wires and uh, a billion synapses or something like that. So um, it is hopeless to try to, we are totally far from knowing what the topology of those things are. Um, uh, except for very simple cases, like uh, at the very periphery of, like in the retina or in the ear, we can, the things are still simple enough that we can trace down the connections between neurons. But further up, it's just, big, just a big mess. Uh, we don't know, the, we have no way of measuring the, the weight of a synapse. We can, if you are lucky, we can stick electrodes in both neurons and, and notice that when this neuron spikes, what happens to the potential of the other one. We can do that when we have uh, neurons in, in vitro, like just two neurons in a Petri dish, and we can do those sorts of experiments. But we cannot do in the brain because we, we, we simply cannot stick two electrodes in two neurons that are connected. <laughs> we simply cannot put the electrodes so precisely like that. So we don't know what the weight of the synapses is. That is uh, how much charge a synapse pumps into the other neuron when it gets excited. Um, and also, um, when we look at a brain in action, we, we know that it is spiking and we can uh, record the spiking on one or two, neur a few neurons, maybe a hundred neurons but there are uh, 15 billions of them. And uh, we, so uh, the vast majority of the neurons, we don't know what they are doing. We don't know their spiking uh, history, uh, even when we are recording, trying to record that. And uh, even when we record the spikes, we don't know what they mean. I mean, we don't know what that neuron is doing. So we see that it's spiking, but it's spiking for what does it mean? What is it reacting to? And what is it trying to, to do? Okay, but anyway, so um, um, so that that ignorance lets us say that well, we can maybe um, we don't have to, it, it is no use to trying to make a model that is too complicated because um, uh, it will be wrong <laughs> anyway. So we can make we can try to make the model that is as simple as possible that models the things that we know that happen uh, and uh, um, and the trust that there might be something like uh, functional equivalence. That is something that electronic engineers know that um, when you are trying to build a circuit, you don't have, a, a, you can choose to build it with um, end gates or gates and the not gates. Or you can instead build a circuit using NAND gates and the NOR gates. Or you can build it with some other, uh, instead of gates that have two inputs, you can build it with gates that have three inputs or whatever. So um, it doesn't matter much because uh, there is the concept of a set of gates being um, equivalent to another set in terms of power. You can, uh, given a circuit designed with the first set of gates, you can build another circuit just by translating each gate here from a little to one or two gates over there. So uh, the, two, uh, the two sets of elementary gates are equivalent um, up to a constant factor in the complexity of the network. Which means translating this into the brain, it means that even if we have a mathematical model of the neuron that is wrong, uh, maybe it doesn't matter because uh, the real neurons can be, more, can be simulated with our mathematical neurons. Maybe uh, what one neuron does, we will need two neurons in our model, but uh, still we can reproduce the same uh, um, function with the same structures, uh, except for that factor of maybe a, bit, a constant factor of complexity. Um, so the, the, the models that most people use when simulating and studying the brain by mathematical methods are 
uh, class of so-called uh, leaky integrate and fire models, um, which is basically a mathematical formula that captures that behavior that I described previously. Namely, um, each synapse, there is a constant weight W. That means that when a signal goes through it, it increases the potential of the second neuron by a, that constant W. Uh, when there is no input, the potential of the neuron decays by a simple exponential towards the uh, baseline potential specified. And when the potential reaches the threshold value, there is a spike that occurs. Okay, uh, so some people write differential equations uh, that uh, have this behavior and they can model the shape of the spike that goes up and then goes down at a certain, with, with a certain profile. Uh, but that uh, accuracy uh, is not needed. It's still much too much detail that we know that it will be wrong. So because, and also the precise timing of the pulses is not critical, at least in most cases. We, I mean, if a pulse gets um, delayed by half a millisecond, probably doesn't make any difference given the way that neurons work. Um, and uh, moreover, we know that the interval between pulses of the same neuron is at least one millisecond. And the amplitude of the spike is not important, uh, at least uh, most, like, um, vast majority of the cases. So we can discretize that model, make a discrete model uh, instead of a continuous model with equ differential equations. We can write different, I mean, recurrence equations for the behavior by assuming that time is discrete and all the neurons evolve in synchronous. Uh, I mean, at each st time step, all the neurons either decide to fire or they don't fire, and then the potential of each neuron changes according to a mathematical formula. And uh, we also can separate the spiking from the potential, uh, non-spiking potential. So we have a variable V that is the, the potential that um, changes as before, except that there are no spikes. I mean, when it reaches a threshold, instead there is a second variable that is just Boolean that records zero or one. And so the second variable says here there is a spike. Here there is no spike, here there is a spike, here there is no spike. And then here the potential, when it reaches the threshold, it drops immediately to the reset potential instead of going through a spike, okay? Um, so we, we model um, by a, still a continuous potential that changes now at, uh, times, uh, at discrete time steps and the sequence of Boolean values, a discrete sequence of Boolean values. Uh, moreover, I mean the firing of the, um, of the neurons is not uh, precise. I mean, if you take one neuron in isolation, the mechanism that starts a spike is very precise. It's a very good precise detector exactly when the difference in potential is 40 millivolts and this fires then. But, when you have the neurons surrounded by many other neurons that are also spiking, that mechanism is sensitive to the difference between the potential inside and outside. And the potential outside varies all the time. So um, the neurons don't fire exactly when you expect to that precise potential, when they are in the middle of, of other neurons. So. Um, the model that we are using here in the Neuromath project is basically what we call the Galvez Lockerback, which is Galvez and Eva Lockerback proposed. Um, uh, the firing is defined by a function that gives the probability of the neuron firing when the voltage is a certain voltage. So this function phi is usually some sigmoidal thing like that. That is, it starts at zero, then it grows gradually to one and then it is one. So, so if the potential is down here, the neuron doesn't fire. If it is here, it certainly fires. And if it is in here, it has a 50% change of firing and uh, so forth. Okay. And um, so that, that uh, models, well, that's uh, good for modeling the noise that comes into the 
if you wanted to simulate uh, the, uh, an actual biological neural circuit, we have to take into account the fact that there is this no noise from the surrounding uh, neurons. And that lets you do that. But also it means that um, um, the, pre the value of the potential doesn't need to be precise. It doesn't make sense to have uh, five digits of potential when you are simulating the potential because uh, the neuron will fire or not uh, with um, a certain range of value. So you can discretize the potential too. And uh, instead of having a continuous variable, you have, say, uh, um, states that, uh, a state where the potential is minus 80, another where it is minus 78, then minus 76, and so forth. So a discrete series of potentials. And then when an input comes in, uh, an input signal comes in, you jump from one of those states to another state with a certain probability distribution. Uh, uh, and so the, then uh, this, the model becomes completely discrete, which is something that uh, uh, theoretical computer science should like. That is, we can model um, the neuron as a stochastic automaton, a stochastic transducer, like that receives inputs and sends outputs, and as a state that is a finite number of discrete states. And uh, the entire um, nervous system has um, um, an array uh, as a collection of such automata talking to each other, sending signals to each other. Um, now, well, in this model, we are ignoring many things. We are pretending that we don't know about those things. And uh, one thing that we are ignoring is that in real neurons, the dendritic tree, well, here we are only assuming that uh, the dendrites only collect signals, add them together, and uh, add that to the potential. But in practice, in real neurons, um, the dendrites are form a tree, and there might be synapses that come from other neurons that attach to the base of a branch. And when the other neuron fires, it shuts off the entire branch. So anything that arrives there for a while is ignored. And then the thing is restored later. So, so the dendrites actually do computation that is not trivial. It's not just adding signals together. And we are ignoring that. If we wanted, we could model that, but we we'll have to be separate um, elements uh, that are the nodes of this dendritic tree. Um, and so um, we are also assuming that there are neurons that are inhibitory, that instead of adding to the potential of the other neuron when they fire, when they fire, they lower the potential and make it less likely to fire. Uh, in practice, the, the way that those inhibitory neurons work is more complicated. We are just modeling them as saying that the W is negative. So when the first neuron fires, the other neuron has its potential decreased by a certain W, constant W. But, uh, um, we have also, we are ignoring the fact that neuron, real neurons change over time. They, uh, no time scales, they change uh, their behavior in scales of seconds, hours, uh, days. Uh, synapses get created and destroyed. Uh, one theory about, uh, uh, we, we know that synapses get created in the cortex during the day and uh, some of them get deleted at night. So the theory is that uh, those synapses that we grow during the day are um, memories that we keep, and uh, when we dream, especially, uh, we are doing garbage collection of those memories. We are removing uh, memories that are not not important <laughs> or whatever, right? And so um, we are not modeling that. I mean, our synapses usually we assume that they are fixed, and uh, also the synaptic the strength of a synapse when it it, it stays there, it, the strength may change. It may change again also when we use, I mean, when, when the neuron fires the, as the sec two times, the second times it makes a smaller change or a bigger change 
in the next neuron, uh, depending on the kind of synapse. We are ignoring that. We are assuming that each synapse just uh, makes always the same change in the potential of the second neuron. And there are things called gap junctions that we not, cannot even talk here. Uh, it's another kind of connection between neurons that uh, behaves slightly different than synapses. So one thing that we have, I mean, that is interesting to notice um, is that um, neurons uh, destroy information. <laughs> it's destroy lots of information because they, have, they receive lots of information from their inputs and their output is much less than that. So um, the, the neuron in particular forgets everything that happened to him, to it, bef um, when it fires. Uh, because it, its potential, which is the only thing that it remembers, it's the memory that it has of the past, uh, gets reset to the voltage reset independently of what it was before firing. And also, while you, there is no input and it, the neuron is not firing, the potential decays towards the baseline potential. As it decays, the information that um, uh, came from the inputs gets smaller and smaller in terms of... Uh, uh, the amount of voltage that uh, the contribution that was made by the input signals gets smaller and smaller and eventually gets below the noise level. And so therefore it is lost. Uh, and information is also lost because when you add a bunch of numbers, you lose information about the numbers, right? If you just have the total, you don't know what the individual numbers are. When you the you can integrate, I mean, the, the, sequ the voltage is the sum over time of several inputs, so that also loses information. And when you threshold, I mean, all the information of the potential that varied along the time, that information is lost. The only thing that matters is what you, whether you reach or not the threshold potential. So you just get one bit out of the, all the history that happened to the neuron and uh, since the previous firing. All the inputs that come in, they are forgotten. The only thing that happens is summarize it into one bit, which is firing. Um, and also when the fact that the, the firing is stochastic also loses information there because you don't know when it fired, whether it fired because the potential was minus 40 or whether it was minus 38 or minus 42. Um, well, so, now, um, okay, so we know how to model neurons. Now, how do we model uh, more complicated circuits? What do we do with those neurons? Uh, for that, we have to um, assign, try to assign meaning to the spikes, which is the only thing that, I mean, the voltage stays inside the neuron, so the only thing that comes out of it is spikes. So we have to find a way to assign meanings to the spikes. The same way that we assign um, in electrical circuits, we assign value zero, the number zero to a certain voltage and the number one to another voltage or the value false or the value true and so forth. Um, and so how do we assign meaning to a train of spikes? There are many ways of doing that, of uh, encoding information in a train of spikes. And two extreme ways um, are what is called spike coding or rate coding. In spike coding, you, you consider that each spike is an important unit of information. So you want to know exactly where the spikes are and when the output spike happens in relation to those input spikes. And the other extreme is rate coding, where you don't care about where exactly the spikes happen or how many there are, only you care about the average, average number of spikes per second. So, um, and uh, there is, I mean, thousands of experiments uh, that are done in the brains that show that the brain uses both systems of encoding and many other systems in between those mixes of spike coding with uh, rate coding. Um, um, so what, what spike coding exactly? Well, you, you look at the spikes as being uh, sparse Boolean event, events. So, so 
you, you don't assume that there are many spikes in the process, but the spikes happen relatively separate from each other. And the, the, the neuron then is desired, the, the, the purpose of the neuron is to spike when it observes a certain pattern of spikes in the input. For example, input one spiked, input two spiked, but input three did not spike, then the neuron spikes. Or when there are two spikes in close succession in input one, and uh, uh, follow it by a spike uh, in input two, then the neuron spikes. Um, so, and those patterns that, that define when the neuron spikes, they must occur, occur within a characteristic time that is uh, related to the leakage time. I mean, when, when the neuron forgets the potential and because it is leaking potential and tending towards the baseline, there is a characteristic time at which, say, it lost half of the potential. That, 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 that's... Uh, Actually, it lost one over e. Uh, the, the potential gets multiplied by one over e. That's the, f the definition of characteristic time of an exponential. Um, so that that time scale, that uh, tau defines the time scale during which a pattern must happen. Because if if the spikes are spaced too far apart, then the neuron forgets the first spikes by the time it sees the second spike, okay? So uh, so either the tau is long and then the spikes can be spaced apart, but then there have to be very few spikes or the spikes are more frequent, but the tau then is smaller. Um, the classical AI neuron that was defined in the 1960s and many people that do neural nets in computer science use, it is the limiting case of this left model when the time tau is zero. So the neuron then forgets completely its past. It only looks at the inputs in the current. Uh, I mean, all the input pulses must come at the same time. Uh, and then it looks at the pattern of zeros and ones in the input and computes a Boolean function that on the output. And that neuron can perform and or majority or whatever. But, uh, and so if, it, if you use a, a tau bigger than zero, that is a neuron that can integrate over time the inputs, then we can do uh, O and R and majority with some leeway. So the spike uh, X can come in one wire, then a few milliseconds later comes in the spike Y, and then you do the, the output is the R or X and Y. So that sort of things can be done by um, uh, spike mode. Uh, the neuron can count spikes. I mean, like, say, if there are three spikes on one wire, then the output, sp uh, the output fires. Uh, if there are three or more in a close su succession like that. Some functions, of course, however, it, the neuron cannot compute. XOR is one function that doesn't seem to be able, possible to compute with just one neuron. If you want to compute the XOR of two signals, you must use at least two neurons and some complicated, some connections between them. Okay, the other kind of then of um, 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 coding that you can consider in modeling neuron, neural nets is rate coding, where <clears throat> you look at a certain window and the signal only computes the average number of uh, pulses that are in there. So you count the number of spikes in that window divided by the length of the window, that's the uh, firing rate. Uh, that can vary between zero and one. Um, and then there is um, um, the, 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 posi the actual spikes, you can consider them as noise on top of that. You, you consider that uh, average, the signal. So if the if the average is um, uh, 0 0.2, uh, that is uh, every, on the average about one every five time steps there is a spike, then the input is 0 0.2 of the neuron. That's the signal that, you are get, that the neuron is getting, 0 0.2. Uh, if it is 0 0.8, then the, the neuron is getting the input 0 0.8, and that's what the neuron should compute. Um, 
Um, and uh, then there is this noise that is, uh, I mean, the actual spikes that um, deviate from that uh, local average, and you treat that as noise. I mean, you would like that uh, your computation to be independent of that as much as possible. So in this view, uh, well, the, the the length of time that you are averaging is the, the, the that characteristic time tau of the leakage, and uh, then you must have at least maybe 10 or more milliseconds. Uh, the new, that is, the neuron must remember at least 10 or more uh, milliseconds of the past in order to be able to compute that average rate with a reasonable accuracy. Uh, so the precise time of the spikes in that window is not important. Um, and uh, the neuron then just takes, you can think of it as an element that takes input rates and output spikes with another output rate. So it's a function from input rates to output rates. Okay. Um, now there is a problem with, uh, uh, with uh, rate coding that um, the range of values that you can encode that way is rather limited because because say well the window cannot be too long i mean say 100 milliseconds means that it takes a tenth of a second for you to react to some to for the neuron to perceive that the input changes so in generally I mean, you rates below 10 hertz 10 pulses per second um, cannot be used. I mean, you, the neuron cannot be able to distinguish 10 pulses per second from 20, from five pulses per second. It's, it doesn't remember that long to compute the thing. And on the other hand, it cannot, the input rate cannot be higher than a thousand pulses per second because the spikes last one millisecond and cannot be spaced closer than that. So that's two orders of magnitude. I mean, you can de detect, uh, you can measure a signal that varies in strength from uh, uh, 10 to 1,000 or from a factor of 100. But many sensory inputs that we need to, that the body needs to process, uh, they have need a much higher dynamic range. Um, uh, sound, for instance, uh, we can, the, the difference between the loudest sound that we can hear without feeling pain and the lowest sound that we can hear uh, in a silent room is about a million in terms of energy. So it is six orders of magnitude, not two. So in order to handle uh, those situations, we know that the many parts of the brain and the nervous system, they use what is called um, progressive encoding. I will have to draw a picture here on the screen. So it is like this. You, instead of using just one neuron to encode the, the quantity that you want, like light intensity or sound intensity, you use three or more, say, three neurons. And the first neuron, so, so this horizontal axis here is the quantity to be encoded, and this is the firing rate. Okay, so um, the first one starts, let's say, from 10 hertz to one kilohertz. And so the first neuron, uh, it will have a response like that. So if the quantity that has to be measured varies from 1 to 100, um, the firing rate varies to uh, 10 hertz to 1 kilohertz, and then it saturates. You can, that neuron just, uh, high, any higher quantity gives the same 1 kilohertz rate. But then the second neuron only starts to react when the intensity is 100, uh, and then it starts firing at 10 hertz and it's saturated to at uh, one kilohertz, uh, but only saturates, so this is when it is 100, and this is when it is 10,000, 10 to the fourth, okay. And then the third neuron 
only starts at this intensity and uh, saturates so this is 10 hertz 1 kilohertz it only saturates at 1 million uh, when the quantity is 1 million so by using those three neurons in parallel uh, the nervous system can encode quantities that span six orders of magnitude. Uh, and of course, this neuro, the, whatever circuit, whatever part of the brain then has to handle that signal, will have to handle three wires instead of one wire. But so it would need more, more neurons, more synapses or whatever. Okay, so, um, and and we can actually measure those things. I mean, for instance, for the uh, the way the the here works, uh, there is an organ called the cochlea that receives sounds and turns that into nerve signals. It is an all rolled up, and if you unroll it, I think it is two centimeters or one fifteen millimeters long. It is a tube, uh, and it has thirty five hundred uh, units. Uh, uh, all similar, except that each one is tuned to uh, react to a specific sound frequency. Very narrow, I mean, like say uh, 1000 hertz to 1003 hertz or something like that. So, uh, and uh, so, so that, that organ makes a Fourier transform of the sound and turns before turning it into 3500 uh, uh, signals, but those signals also they are progressively encoded. So each of those frequencies has sends actually three axons to the brain uh, encoded that way, uh, with the, the intensity of that particular frequency inside. Um, okay, so basically, uh, that's. Uh, that's another way of looking at neurons. There are other ways of looking at signals between spike, individual spikes and just the rate. Uh, for instance, the auditory cortex, um, also uh, one of the functions that, uh, that uh, the sound serves besides uh, speech and whatever, you have to detect the direction where when the sound comes. And that is done very low in the brain because if you hear a noise, you turn towards the noise by reflex action. You don't go through the cortex of the brain to decide that. As soon as you hear a noise coming from that way, you instinctively turn over there. So, Unless, of course, the thing is being suppressed because you are in a noisy environment or whatever, right? But, uh, but uh, so, um, and uh, how does the brain does that? Well, the low frequencies, um, the unit that responds to say 300 hertz, it spikes at 300, it spikes at 300 hertz um, uh, in, in synchrony with the sound. Every time the sound reaches a peak, it sends out a little one or more spikes, then it's, the next peak it sends few more spikes and so forth. And so uh, there is a part on the way up to the brain before reaching the brain, there is a place where those two signals from the two ears come together. And um, uh, that part compares the timing of the pulses. So because um, this, if the sound is coming from that direction, it reaches this ear a little bit earlier than this uh, than here. And so by comparing the difference between the times of the two spikes, uh, that part of the, bra of the brain, before reaching the actual cortex, can de determine that the sound is coming from that direction. But for higher frequencies, like frequencies higher than one kilohertz, the, the, neuro the neurons in the cochlea cannot respond that fast. Uh, so they, instead they just send out a stream of random spikes uh, that is propor the rate is proportional to the intensity, but they are not synchronized with the sound wave. Uh, and so those signals also are processed to determine direction, but then the determina they don't, the, 
um, the units that are responsible for those frequencies, they don't use timing information because the timing of the spikes doesn't mean anything, but they use the volume information because if the sound, if a high frequency sound is coming that way, um, it, the volume is slightly higher on this ear than on this ear. And so by comparing the volumes of the two, the, of the, the rates of spiking from two, the two ears, the brain can tell that the sound is coming over there. Uh, and that's a very complicated process because the, so if you, if you have a hair coming out front of one ear, then the brain must uh, adjust for that. I mean, it must learn that upside. Uh, I mean, there is something happening that makes this ear slightly less sensitive than this one. So when you compare the volume, it has to compensate for that effect and still determine that the volume based on the difference of volumes corrected by that effect, uh, the sound must come from that place. Okay, so, so there are, uh, just in the auditory system, even though the neurons seem to be very similar, there are clearly places for, for certain frequencies it is using spike coding, a mix of spike coding and uh, rate coding, and for other frequencies of sound, it is using just rate coding. Okay, just so to finish this talk, I would uh, try to talk a little bit about the little that we know about the cortex. Um, the, the, the higher scale organization of the cortex. Um, and um, uh, we don't know very much, but we know only that uh, it appears to be organized in columns. I mean, uh, you have this lab that is one square meter in area, 2.5 millimeters thick and in the cross direction. And the neurons seem to be connected much more strongly uh, in the cross direction than le with the laterally, I mean horizontally. Uh, so, and by sticking electrodes uh, at various depths in the cortex, people have noticed uh, that usually when um, neurons in one column get active, all of them, all, the entire column gets active, and the neighboring column may not be doing anything. Um, so activity in the brain seems to be organized along those columns. So each column gets active or not, not each neuron or each layer or whatever. Uh, so there are about 150 million of those. Um, each one contains about 100 neurons. And they are, they seem to be all alike. I mean, uh, not only they are all alike, but also all animals, um, all mammals at least, uh, they have about the same organization. The only difference between the human cortex and the mouse cortex seems to be that we have many more uh, columns and therefore neurons in the cortex than he has. But otherwise he has columns and they are organized the same way as ours. Um, so, um, and uh, the columns communicate to each other mostly through the base here that goes into the white matter by sending wires to other columns. And uh, say so a column here, you can detect that when it fires, then five or six columns on the other side of the brain or the, other, or the same side, they fire too. They're always very specific. So there are connections that are, seem to be very specific, but uh, we cannot figure out any pattern <laughs> to that. Right, then we can see that, uh, I mean, it's long been known that different parts of the cortex seem to be doing different things. For instance, the part in the back is mostly concerned with vision. It's where the optic nerves, um, they cross the brain and end up here. And here is, you can detect when, for instance, um, stereo vision is happening because um, uh, Neuro, the signals from one little spot in the retina of this eye and the corresponding spot in the retina of this eye, they come together uh, in one column and that column is sensitive to, the, uh, to a certain disparity or whatever, right? So um, each column in the cortex here seems to be sensitive, for instance, to edges in what you are seeing that are oriented in a specific direction. And if you look at the next neighboring column, the, they are um, 
there is a, they are sensitive to edges in the same spot of the retina, but tilted maybe 10 degrees with respect to the first one. So there is a complex uh, encoding uh, of the image that you see that goes off in the way in the way between the eyes and uh, the cortex, uh, visual cortex in the back. Uh, the top of the cortex seems to be concerned with high level motor decisions, like when you want to more coffee, you decide that you have to grab uh, with this hand the cup of coffee. So that involves the, the, uh, the decision to move seems to be made uh, the, that this motion is decided over here. Uh, the front part of the cortex seems to be more concerned with abstract reasoning, logic, motivation, whatever. Uh, there is a part over here on the side that is connected with language and, uh, and hearing. But uh, on the other hand, I mean, we also know that if one part of the brain gets damaged, uh, people lose the fun that function, uh, but then with exercise, they can recover it because that function gets simply uh, relocated to some other part of the brain. So all those columns, they seem to be um, general purpose processors, not specific to one specific task, but capable of doing any, t uh, any task if uh, connected properly or if uh, use it properly or program it properly, who knows, right? Uh, so that's, it, so it is tempting to look at the cortex as a parallel processor with 150 million processing elements, except that uh, since they have only 100 neurons each, they must be much less general purpose than our processors. We cannot expect them to run, uh, say, uh, a Python program or whatever <laughs> inside of them. Uh, so we don't know exactly what uh, uh, we don't know exactly what each column does. What we know we can see is that if you look now at a slice of a column, we can see six layers of neurons with uh, each one with their different types of neurons, from neurons that have more connections, less connections, and so forth, and lots of fibers that go up and down across the column, I mean uh, vertically across this layer, and some. Uh, neurons that go horizontally within each layer and lots of uh, uh, connections that go uh, out into the white matter and connect to other columns elsewhere in the cortex uh, or other parts of the brain. And we don't know exactly how those neurons are connected, but we can only count that, say, neurons in this layer, the 50% of the connections go to that layer, 30% go to this layer, and so forth. So we have a, t a table that says uh, what percentage of, of connections uh, are within each pair of layers, but we don't know exactly how the connections are. We don't know the strength of the synapses or whatever. We know that some neurons are inhibitory, that is, they tend to, when they fire, they suppress activity in other neurons. Uh, and that's basically it. So it's still a mystery what the cortex actually, what each of those little processors in the cortex actually does. Okay. Uh, well, so that's it. I hope that, well, uh, I don't know if I managed to um, attract any. Uh, computer theory, computational theorists to this area, and I hope that I haven't uh, discouraged any <laughs> people that are in Euromat from <laughs> continuing this path. Okay, thank you very much.